In this video, we will look at logistic regression, which, despite its name, is a classification model. Logistic regression is a form of discriminative classifier, which we defined in the last video. It's the kind of classifier that takes the probability distribution of the class conditional on the instance and tries to learn that function directly. And we'll pick up where we left off in the second lecture. In the second lecture, we noted that using the error as a loss function would not give us a good loss landscape. So we started the search for loss functions that would give us a nice smooth loss landscape and would put the optimum in the same place as the optimum of the error. We saw one example already, which was the least squares loss. Our thinking here is that the hyperplane classifier was defined in terms of a linear function wx plus b, assigning the positive class if this function evaluates to a positive value and the negative class if the function evaluates to a negative value. So why not just give these positive and negative classes some values, plus 1 and minus 1 respectively, for instance, and treat this as a regression problem? Here is another option. Instead of giving negative and positive points arbitrary values, we give them probabilities, specifically the probability of being positive. This probability is 1 for all points in the positive class and 0 for all points in the negative class. This doesn't look substantially different to our linear classifier because our function still ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity. It doesn't yet produce probabilities, except over a very narrow range. What we need is a way to squeeze this whole range into the range between 0 and 1, so that the model can only ever produce valid probabilities. And for this purpose, we will use the logistic sigmoid function. So the function that looks like this, it has as its domain the entire real number line, but as its range, the values between 0 and 1. It's defined by this function, or alternatively by the function in gray. One interesting property of the sigmoid function is that if we mirror it in the vertical axis, we get the same function that we get when we mirror it along the horizontal line that crosses the point 0 0.5. Symbolically, 1 minus the sigmoid function is equal to the sigmoid function with a negative argument. With this tool in hand, we can turn our classifier into a function that produces a probability. We simply apply the parameters of a linear function as before, but we take the output of that linear function and feed it to the logistic sigmoid function. This produces a probability that the point x belongs to the positive class. This may be a very accurate probability or a very inaccurate one, depending on how we choose w and b, but it's always a value between 0 and 1. Now all we need is a loss function that tells us which probabilities actually match the data, so that we can then use that loss function to search for a good value of w and a good value of b. For this purpose, we will follow the philosophy of the maximum likelihood objective that we've seen before. First, some notation. We'll refer to a data point by a lowercase x, and we will refer to the probability produced by our classifier for a particular class as q subscript x with the class as the argument. And since these need to sum to 1 over all classes, once we know the probability that our classifier assigns to the positive class, we also know the probability that it assigns to the negative class. Furthermore, we split our data into two subsets, the positive and the negative examples, and we refer to these as x subscript p and x subscript n. Now with this notation in place, our task is to find the classifier q that maximizes the probability of the true classes. That is, we will use the maximum likelihood objective. With our notation, that looks like this. We take the probability of the data to be the probability of the labels given the instances, and we can compute this by iterating over the data and computing the probability of the correct class label given our classifier for each instance and multiplying these probabilities. And our job then is to look for the model q that maximizes this probability. As before, we will take the logarithm of this probability. As before, we will take the logarithm of this probability because it's easier to work with. And because we're looking for a loss function, we want something that we minimize to optimize the model fit. So we'll stick a minus sign in front of our function. 
we can then take the product out of the logarithm, turning it into a sum. And we can split this sum over the whole data into a sum over the positive instances in our data plus the negative instances in our data. And minimizing this loss function leads to the solution to our logistic regression problem. To visualize what this means, let's look back first at the least squares classifier. In this case, we computed the residuals indicated here by vertical bars. And the value that we tried to minimize was the sum of the squares of these residuals. For the logistic regression, the picture looks like this. For every point, we get a probability. Probability of a positive point being positive is the height of the logistic function under that point. And the probability of a negative point being negative according to the classifier is the distance between the logistic function and the value 1. And what we try to maximize is the sum of the logarithms of these values. So if we look at the negative log function plotted here, which relates the size of one of these bars to its effect on the loss, we see that the bigger the bar gets, the less it contributes to the loss. So the bigger the bar, the better. And we also see that bars that are very close to zero contribute a lot to the loss, and bars that get closer to one contribute a lot less to the loss. So in this case, we see that the points near the decision boundary are likely to contribute the most to the loss. Now, in order to apply gradient descent to this problem and to actually find a solution, we need to work out what the gradient is. We know how to do this. We fill in the loss function and we take its derivative with respect to each of our parameters. And we'll show how to do this for one of the elements in W, which we'll call WI. We fill in the loss function, which consists of these two sums. And the first thing we do is we work the sum out of the gradient. And we'll focus on the term that applies to positive instances. So we start with the derivative of just this term, and we fill in the definition of QXP, which is just the logarithm of the sigmoid applied to the output of our linear function. We fill in the sigmoid, which looks very complicated, but we note that here again the logarithm simplifies things a lot, allowing us to isolate the denominator and turn the fraction into a simple minus out in front of our expression. To deal with the logarithm, we apply the chain rule, where the derivative of the logarithm gives us this expression for the factor on the left. If the logarithm is not a natural logarithm, we end up with a constant multiplier on the left, indicated in gray. Here, for instance, assuming that the logarithm is 2, which we can safely remove if we're doing gradient descent, since the behavior of gradient descent is not much affected by it. We can also use the natural logarithm, and then this factor disappears naturally. The factor on the right, we work out by applying the chain rule again to get rid of the exponent. For the first factor produced by this chain rule, we get the derivative of the exponent. And in the second factor, the only relevant term is this dot product, which is in itself a sum. And the only part of that sum is relevant is wi times xi, which gives us the derivative xi. And in the last step, we apply the property that we learned in slide 71, namely that this first factor on the left is an expression of the sigmoid function that we were already using, except that this time its argument is negative. And a sigmoid function with a negative argument is equal to 1 minus the sigmoid function. So that's what we fill in on the right. And this expression is equal to the probability that our classifier gives to the class being negative. So a lot of math with a lot of complicated expressions, but the final outcome is a very simple result. So going back to our complete expression for the gradient of this log loss, we see that we get this simple expression. And for the terms corresponding to the negative instances, a very similar sort of derivation follows. So this is logistic regression. We use the sigmoid function to turn a linear function into a discriminative probabilistic classifier. We apply log loss, maximizing the log likelihood of the data given the model, maximizing the log likelihood 
of the observed classes given the model parameters, and we derive the gradient of this loss function and search for good weights. There is no analytical solution for this problem, but the problem is convex, so we can be sure that gradient descent will quickly and efficiently find the optimal solution. And note again that logistic regression is a bit of a misnomer, since we're actually building a classifier. Let's finish up this video by seeing what that looks like in practice. Here is a dataset in a two-dimensional feature space that shows a common failure case for the least square classifier. The points at the top are so far away from the ideal decision boundary that they will have huge residuals under the least squares model. And there are no similar points for the negative class to balance this out. The result is that after a little bit of gradient descent, the least squares model ends up far from the ideal decision boundary. Here's a sketch of that problem in 1D. We see some blue points and some red points near the decision boundary, but some of the blue points are so far away from the correct decision boundary that they get large residuals and pull too much on the line. In the case of the logistic model, we don't have this problem. Because if the model fits well around the decision boundary, it doesn't have to worry at all about points that are far away. Get a probability for positive very close to 1, so they contribute almost nothing to the loss function. And indeed, when we apply logistic regression to our data set, we see that it finds, we see that it finds an optimal decision boundary separating the classes perfectly. And here is what our logistic function looks like as it colors the plane. In this picture, blue indicates areas with a high probability of positive, and red indicates areas with a high probability of negative. And we see that the decision boundary is a relatively thin line in between the two point clouds. Note that for such well separable classes as in this data set, there are many suitable decision boundaries, and logistic regression really has no reason to prefer one over the other. For both of these models, all points are assigned the correct probability very close to one. In the next lecture, we'll see a solution to this problem when we meet our last loss function, the SVM loss. For now, let's finish up with a recap of what we've learned. In logistic regression, we use the logistic sigmoid to provide class probabilities from a linear function. We use the negative logarithm of those class probabilities to give us a loss function. And we see that points near the decision boundary get more influence than points far away. This is the opposite of the least squares classifier, and in classification problems, this is often what we want. The log loss generalizes very naturally to multi-class classification, and we'll look at how to do that in the context of neural networks. In the final video of this lecture, we'll take a quick look at information theory, and in the ways it can build a deeper understanding of some of the concepts that we've seen so far in this lecture.